Hi everybody, this is Professor Malcolm Keating, and I'll be talking to you today about Shantideva's Bodhicharya Vatara. But since this lecture is recorded ahead of time, I'm taking advantage of the technology to bring in two experts to help me. My name's Connie Kasser. I am an assistant professor of religious studies at Lawrence University in Wisconsin in the U.S. My area of expertise is Tibetan Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhist philosophy in particular, but at Lawrence, I'm responsible for teaching basically every religious tradition in all of Asia. I'm Stephen Harris, and I teach philosophy at Leiden's Institute for Philosophy in the Netherlands. And I specialize in Indian philosophy, and especially Buddhist philosophy, and in particular, Buddhist ethics. Let's get started. First of all, who is Shantideva, and when is he writing? So Shantideva lived in the 8th century in India, and he was a monk. So... Um, you know, in the context of sort of the, the the broader society, he was he was a person in, in pretty high status, um, and and he was a student at Nalanda University, so this this really elite institution. Um, but Shanti Deva was was kind of regarded by his peers as a lazy student. Um, <laughs> he he was he was given this nickname by his by his peers um in in sanskrit it's um i think it's busuku which which basically um is is a, a kind of conglomeration of three words it basically means um someone who who eats sleeps and goes to the toilet um, and presumably that's that's the only thing that Shantideva's peers ever saw him doing. The story goes that his peers challenge him to lecture on something that nobody has studied before. So he sits down and recites the Bodhicharya of Atara. And, you know, and then the, according to the story, when he gets to the ninth chapter, which is the philosophically most most complicated part of the text, he starts to rise into the air off of his throne. And the end of the text is just heard by his disembodied voice. Um, and, you know, so some of his peers were frantically scribbling things down while he was teaching and people wrote things down in different ways. And so that's um, supposedly why we have slightly different versions of the Bodhicharya Avatara. The text that Shantideva writes is part of a Buddhist tradition known as Mahayana. In this class so far, we haven't looked at these kinds of Buddhists. Instead, we've been looking at Buddhists who have a slightly different understanding of the goals of Buddhism. Yeah, so the primary training from texts like the questions of King Melinda is to eliminate one's own suffering and eliminate the causes for one's own rebirth. Um, there's actually still deep emphasis placed on compassion and concern for others, but that's seen as part of one's own development to escape from samsara for oneself. Samsara is the cycle of life, death, and rebirth that everybody is caught in until they rid themselves of it through the Buddhist path and then achieve nirvana. Now, Mahayana thinkers contrast themselves and their understanding with a different emphasis in early Buddhism. So the Mahayanas claim this is something that they more deeply emphasize this idea of remaining in samsara, deliberately taking rebirth to end the suffering of others. And some texts, I think Shantideva's may be one of those, but this isn't completely obvious. Some texts claim that this is actually the only way out of samsara, is um, becoming a bodhisattva, eventually becoming a Buddha, and in some sense remaining in, uh, in samsara to work forever for the benefit of others. Shanti Deva is writing this text for people who already have or maybe are considering taking the bodhisattva vows. Being a bodhisattva is kind of seen, especially around around Shanti Deva's time, as a kind of vocation, maybe even more than a philosophical school. It's kind of seen as a sort of duty. A bodhisattva is a being who's in the process of becoming awakened. They're waking up to the way that the world really is. But they're not yet a Buddha, an awakened one. And they don't really just acquire this knowledge only for themselves. So, you know, if you're following the Mahayana path, you really have to follow the bodhisattva ideal. You really have to um, engage in Buddhist practices, in Buddhist ways of thinking, in the right ways, in order to be of benefit to all beings. The text, then, is probably directed to educated monks, like those monks who challenged Shantideva to recite something at Nalanda. But as you'll see in this lecture, there are ways that the text can speak beyond the original audience. 
So his audience is educated monks taking the bodhisattva vow. But what kind of text is it? Well, this semester we've read a philosophical novel, we've read a sutra-style textbook with its own commentary, and we've read a meditation. What is the Bodhicharya Avatara? Primarily, it's a training manual with meditations and characterizations of various mental states, the mental states that he sees as essential to constituting the fully developed mind that does not suffer itself and is able to remove the suffering of others. So the text then is a training manual for Mahayana Buddhists who are taking a vow to become a bodhisattva. The text is to help them cultivate themselves to remove suffering, both their own suffering and that of others. In order to do this, readers are instructed in how to cultivate certain perfections. Yeah, so there's a set of six or ten, but especially, uh, most importantly, six perfections. And these are um, generosity, ethical restraint, patience, something like energetic effort, view is a bit hard to translate, meditative concentration, and then insight or wisdom. And these provide the structure of Shantideva's text, but for reasons that aren't completely obvious, he doesn't simply offer a chapter on each of them. He offers a chapter on four of them. In our class, you're not assigned the entire text, but you might consider reading it anyway. After all, this text is written as an instruction manual, and, well, I don't know about you, but there have been a few times when I wish I would have read the entire instruction manual before putting something together or trying to operate a tool. And I, th I think, you know, ideally, um, if you can make the time for it, to read the text or, or a portion of the text, whatever, um, three times. So read it once all the way through, maybe, you know, read it out loud and... Um, just to get a sense of what Shanti Deva is doing, you know, if you can, if you can read this out loud or get together with a classmate and and take turns reading and listening, I something about the text, I feel like it just it hits you in a different way if you can hear it. As we'll see in the rest of this lecture, this is not an easy text. Uh, and it has a lot of rich potential for interpretation. Stephen Harris, who has spent his entire career working on this text, says... Like, my own relation to the text has changed so much in the 10 years since on and off I've been working on it. So how do we, as novices, begin to understand these materials? Well, there are two perspectives we can think about understanding a text from. We can look at small sections of the text, which we'll do in this lecture. First of all, starting with some salient passages that you can work with in relative isolation. I think that's a fine way to begin. But once you've looked at the smaller units, you also want to keep in mind the big picture, at the level of the larger chapters and also of the work as a whole. I've come to believe that every chapter has an important structure and every sort of piece within that chapter does particular work towards the games of that chapter. This is how we'll approach the text in this lecture. In the next section, we'll look at chapter 6 on forbearance, both in terms of its overall aims and some particular smaller pieces. After that, we'll turn to chapter 8 on meditative absorption and do the same thing. We'll then end with some reflections about the text as a whole. Before we move on, there's one other piece of understanding this material. As we've said, this is a text intended as an instruction manual. Um, so there, it's not something you just kind of pick up and decide, oh, okay, I want to think about concentration today. You're actually supposed to kind of work your way through the text. Um, and as Shantideva is, is teaching and explaining things, you are supposed to kind of do the things that he's telling you you should do. Now, just like in my last lecture, I wasn't trying to convince you God does or doesn't exist, but I wanted to get you to reflect on your own reasons for belief. So today, I'm not trying to convince you to be a Buddhist, but I do want you to reflect on the experiences that Shantideva is describing. So for that reason, I have uploaded two optional meditations that you can try out.